God reigns. Summer quarter, the righteous reign of God, unit one. The prophets proclaim God's power. Your God reigns. Our lesson today comes from Isaiah chapter 52, verses 7 through 12 from the New American Standard Bible. How delightful on the mountains are the feet of one who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen, raise their voices. They shout joyfully together, for they will see with their own eyes when the Lord restores Zion. Be cheerful, shout joyfully together, you ruins of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, so that all the ends of the earth may see the salvation of our God. Depart, depart, go out from there. Do not touch what is unclean. Go out of the midst of her. Purify yourselves, you who carry the vessels of the Lord. But you will not go out in a hurry, nor will you go as fugitives. For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Did you know <clears throat> that the verses in our lesson today contain key messianic themes found throughout the New Testament? When you compare Isaiah 52 verse 3 with 1 Peter 1 verses 18 and 19 and 52 verse 7, with Romans chapter 10, verse 15. The apostles saw the kingdom that Jesus inaugurated. You'll find that in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, as the choice fulfillment of these promises. That Israel in her exile was counted worthless. You'll find that in chapter 3 of chapter I mean, verse 3 of chapter 52. But in this riddle, God promise, God's promise of redemption suggests a price beyond money. John 3.16 offers the answer to the puzzle. That the imagery of celebration, clean, beautiful clothing that you find in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 52 on the heels of sorrow and oppression, chains, dirt, also found in verse 2 of chapter 52, hinges on the coming presence of God with his people that you'll find in verses 6 and 8 of chapter 52. It is God's presence that brings healing freedom, joy, and protection that you find in verses 8 through 10 of, of our lesson today. That the messenger's announcement in verse 7 echoes traditional enthronement scenarios found in 2 Samuel chapter 15 verse 10 and 2 Kings chapter 9 verse 13. That Jerusalem as a city, both structures and inhabitants, was to be holy like the temple itself, and the rationale is found in God's presence. The whole city was to reflect God's character now that he was fully present with his people. Did you know that we should see the parallels and contrast with the original exodus out of Egypt? God went with them. Compare, compare 
chapter 52, verse 12, with Exodus chapter 14, verse 19. And that this exodus from exile was orderly. Compare Exodus chapter 12, verses 31 through 39 with Isaiah chapter 52, verse 12, and Ezra chapter 1, verse 3. And the people brought nothing out of their exile that was idolatrous or impure physically or in their hearts. And you'll find that um, in Exodus chapter 32. Our biblical, historical, geographical, and cultural background. <clears throat> the book of Isaiah is the first of three major prophets, the three longest prophetic books. Its position as the first reflects the fact that Isaiah himself lived in the eighth century, whereas the other two major prophets, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, lived approximately 100 years later. Isaiah reflects several different periods, but it not but is not an anthology of unrelated prophecies. In all three parts of the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 1 through 39, Isaiah 40 through 55, and Isaiah 56 through 66, Yahweh is the Holy One of Israel. The entire book is a message from the Holy One of Israel. <clears throat> Isaiah of Jerusalem lived in the second half of the 8th century BC and addressed himself to the conditions existing at the time. It is believed that his ministry began in 739 BC and continued to be a voice for God until well into the reign of King Manasseh. In the writing of Isaiah, Judah and Israel were still in existence as independent kingdoms. However, in Isaiah chapters 40 through 55, the background for these scriptures is not the eighth century, but instead the middle of the sixth century BC. Contemporary scholarship suggests that Isaiah's chapters 40 through 66 has a different theological focus from Isaiah chapters 1 through 39. Many biblical scholars believe that different persons wrote chapters 1 through 39 of Isaiah and chapters 40 through 66. However, this neither takes away from nor questions the entire book's divine inspiration. <clears throat> Isaiah prophesied for more than 40 years to the nation of Judah. During his prophetic ministry, the nation was experiencing great moral and political upheaval. Bible scholars suggest that even though the nations of Assyria and Egypt threatened Judah, Judah was spared from being destroyed mainly because of Isaiah's prophetic influence. Chapter 52 of Isaiah from which today's lesson comes, is a part of the prophecies of comfort embedded in chapters 40 through 56. In chapters 1 through 39, the focus of Isaiah's prophecies was God's divine condemnation for Judah's sin. In chapters 40 through 46, the prophet comforts Judah with God's promise of hope and restoration. In chapters 49 through 57, the focus is on the prophecy of Israel's deliverer. One of the hallmarks of 
biblical prophecy is the phrase, thus says the Lord, or this is what the Lord says. Whenever God commissioned a prophet, that prophet was obligated to speak only what the Lord instructed him to speak. It can be correctly stated that the actual test of a prophet's calling and identity was whether what he or she prophesied came true. Who or what is a prophet? Heather Adams states that a prophet is someone chosen by God to speak for God. Whatever the time period or tidings, the prophet's job was to impart God's message accurately. Persons called to this task came from differing backgrounds, personalities, and levels of social status. But what they all had in common was a heart for God, an anointing to hear him, and the faithfulness to impart his message to others. And this comes from uh, BibleStudyTools.com, and I have given you the website. <clears throat> Many references to prophets are made in the Bible. A cursory view of the Bible reveals that major sections of the Old Testament are devoted to a collection of books by prophets. Their names and quotes appear all over the New Testament and are the subject of sermons even today. For an individual to say, this is what the Lord says, carries divine import and should not be viewed lightly or considered inadvisably. The impact of the words from the Lord has with it heavenly reward or punishment, mercy or judgment, hope or hopelessness. When God placed a succession of rulers or kings in place in the life of the nations of Israel and Judah, he provided prophets to advise the rulers or kings and declare his word directly to the nations. It is important to note that God usually never communicated directly with the ruler or king. His intermediary was always the prophet. The prophet was divinely authorized to speak truth to power and was backed up by the authority of heaven. Most Bible scholars considered Isaiah one of the greatest of God's prophets. Isaiah's ministry lasted through the reigns of five of Judah's kings. The themes in the book of Isaiah include the holiness of God, the prediction of the invasion of Jerusalem, and the future coming of the deliverer. The book of Isaiah is regarded as an important prophetic book. The phrase prophetic books refers to a group of writings in the Old Testament. They have been divided into two groups, major and minor. The distinction relates to the book's size rather than the importance of the individual or message. The Quest Bibles, the Quest Study Bible describes Isaiah as a prophet who understood the two-sided nature of God's character, mercy and judgment, grace and discipline, justice and forgiveness, and exile and salvation. These paradoxes are seen in Isaiah's writings, and as modern-day readers examine his prophecy, they are faced with the decision, just like Judah, to respond in faith or unbelief. Isaiah described what he saw in his visions to effectively communicate 
this paradox, hoping to impress Judah with the contrast between God's holiness and Judah's sin. What did prophets do as a part of their prophetic duties? Biblical scholars remind us that God directed prophets to act out their messages as visual reminders or object lessons. Isaiah walked barefoot and stripped down for three years to signify Jerusalem's coming captivity. A true prophet is God's mouthpiece. He is God's spokesman. He is one who accurately predicts or foretells the future and foretells or communicates the will of God as God has revealed it to him. The prophet brings revelation and direction to the people and lays the foundation for a proper relationship with God. Chapter 52 of the book of Isaiah presents the theme of God's deliverance for his people, which now reached its most significant expression in the servant of the Lord who would suffer for the sins of his people. The prophet foresaw the time when Jerusalem would once again be the holy city and the uncircumcised and the unclean, meaning unrighteous, would no longer enter her gates. Isaiah 52 is a part of the section of the book of Isaiah referred to as Second Isaiah, meaning Isaiah chapters 40 through 46, by some biblical scholars. Isaiah 52 is also to be understood as a response to Isaiah chapter 51, particularly Isaiah 51 verses 23 and 24. God called his people to put on the righteous garments of equity and justice. The book of Isaiah presents a rich landscape of salvation history on an eternal and global scale. Isaiah, in essence, declared that God has a purpose and plan and his eternal decree will stand. God's declaration will neither be thwarted by strong and aggressive nations, you'll find that in Isaiah 14, verses 26 and 27, nor derailed by unfaithful ones. You find that in Isaiah 1, verse 4 and 9. God has a message for the world that he created, and he declares the following without ambiguity. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish my purpose. You'll find that in Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9b and 10. Our lesson explained. The messenger tasked with bringing the good news concerning freedom from Babylonian captivity is declared as having beautiful feet. The reference to the feet of the messengers who bring good news should be understood from the perspective that the beautiful, hopeful message is what makes the messenger's feet beautiful. The good news concerning the release of the Jews from Babylonian captivity is the backdrop for, the, for this verse. The good news is the ultimate salvation of the Hebrew people who had been confined to the horrors of Babylonian captivity. The good news encompassed peace, good tidings, salvation, and the reign of God. The word translated peace is shalom. Verses 
which speaks of the absence of conflict. Interestingly enough, 70 years prior, it was conflict and war that led to the captivity of the Israelites. However, the war had finally ended. The term good tidings suggests that the season of darkness had passed and light had arrived. Good tidings means that there was no bad news to blemish the good news. The word salvation has a liberating emphasis in this text. Liberation is a common focus in the Hebrew tradition dating back to the Exodus experience when God freed the captives from Egypt. The chains that kept the people in bondage for the past 70 years had been broken and the people were free to return home. With the phrase, your God reigns, there is a prophetic declaration that the empires of this world will not ultimately rule. The phrase speaks of God's rule over darkness and God's rule over the power of the enemy. The release of the people from bondage affirms the fact that God reigns. The watchmen, who's, those who look out for the people's welfare, would lift their voices in unity, singing praises to God while inviting and invoking others to join with them in their praises. The language used in verse 8 is taken from the custom of placing watchmen on the walls of a city or on elevated towers who could see if an enemy approached, and who, of course, would be the first to discern a messenger at a distance who was coming to announce the good news. The idea is that there would be great joy at the announcement of the return of the exiles from captivity. And you'll um, this was taken from BibleTools.org, and I have also given you that website. Although this reference in verse 8 was initially applied to the return from Babylon, it contains the general truth that those appointed to watch over Zion and its interests would rejoice at all the symbols of God's favor to his people, especially when he would come to bless them after long times of darkness and depression and calamity. Jerusalem was lying in waste and in ruins. The call by the prophet for the waste places of Jerusalem to break out into expressions of praise is in accord with a style that frequently occurs in Isaiah, where inanimate objects are called on to manifest their joy. Here is the process. First, the messenger signaled good news. Then the watchman on the wall would burst out in song to celebrate the good news. The prophet calls the waste places of Jerusalem to join in the joyful song. One notable insight is to remember that this is poetry in which it is possible, meaning symbolically, for ruins to raise their voice in song. One might also think of the ruins of the city as a representation of the people of Jerusalem. The Babylonians had ruined their lives, but now 
they could rejoice and break forth in singing because Yahweh had made their restoration possible. They would no longer be considered ruined people, but would instead be redeemed. Who had made this possible? Verse 9b gives us the answer. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. As a result of divine intervention, the ruins of Jerusalem would not remain in ruins because Yahweh had comforted and rescued his people and had redeemed Jerusalem. This does not mean that the rebuilding of the walls and the people of Jerusalem was complete, but it does mean that the Lord had determined to bring into reality redemption so the people could be con confident that it would happen. <clears throat> the word redeemed has to do with release from bondage and usually involves payment or ransom to achieve freedom. Interestingly, second Isaiah opens with the call to comfort God's people. You'll find that in verse chapter 40, verse 1. And it ends with their deliverance and comfort, which you'll find in chapter 51, verse 3 and chapter 52, verse 9. In essence, what the people had hoped for was becoming a reality. Perhaps this is why some biblical scholars refer to verse 9 as a song sung by all of Jerusalem as the choir and orchestra. The hopeless and helpless predicament of Israel had been remedied by the power and presence of Almighty God. The prophet continues his discourse by explaining to Israel's people how the Lord during this time would reveal his power in plain view of all nations. Israel's redemption would be a worldwide phenomenon that illuminated the power and personhood of God. The prophet declares that God would, would show himself as the enforcer of the good news. The entire world would be witness to what God can do with his mighty arms. For Isaiah, the arm of the Lord highlights the authority and actions of God to accomplish mighty works. You'll find that in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 10, chapter 51, verse 9, and chapter 52, verse 10 of our lesson. His victory would be announced and circulated. His strong power would be apparent in the land. The prophet is judicious in emphasizing that God's power through the bearing or flexing of his holy arm will be seen in relationship to the salvation that he will bring about. That salvation relates to that of Israel, God's chosen people. Therefore, the display of God's power had a twofold purpose in this text, our lesson today, to be visible to all Isaiah chapter 52 verse 10b and to bring salvation to the whole world verse 10c of our lesson. As the prophet proclaims the good news of deliverance, he commands the people to move from their place of bondage immediately. The people were not to waste any time getting out of the place of bondage. As they moved from bondage to freedom, they were further commanded not to touch 
anything unclean. God did not want the con the contamination of their place of bondage to have any attachment to his people. They were now free and they were to act like they were free. The idea of not touching any unclean things implies that they were not to repeat or pick up sinful habits as they traveled from the promise of God's deliverance. Many biblical scholars believe, however, that they were allowed to carry only the holy artifacts taken from the temple during the invasion of the Babylonians. Nevertheless, the emphasis is on God's call to holiness as the people journeyed home. The newly delivered exiles must depart Babylon and the simple way of life that caused their exile in the first place. It is, is essential to be free from outside forces that imprison us, but it is even more important to be free from the forces within that prevent us from achieving freedom. You'll find that in Isaiah, in our lesson today, verses 7 through 10. And this comes from Sermon Writer. And I have given you the website, sermonwriter.com, biblical commentary. When people were instructed to touch not anything unclean, that come. Man implies that because the Lord is holy, he expects his people to be holy. The people were to purify themselves, to be fit for the task ahead, carrying the temple vessels from Babylon to Jerusalem. When the people were told, for you shall not go out in haste, neither shall you go by flight. Their ancestors departed from Egypt would come to mind. In that experience, their ancestors had to flee in haste and were threatened by the pursuit of Pharaoh and his armed forces. In contrast, in this instance, the people's departure from Babylonia will be unharried and safe from threat. Cyrus of Persia will allow them to depart under the protection of his imperial decree and will even provide funds to help them with the restoration of Jerusalem and the temple. Um, and you also find that in sermon a commentary from sermonwriter.com and I've given you the website. Interestingly, the prophet illuminated the universality of God in that all nations would see the glory of Almighty God. Perhaps the emphasis on the universality of God would be very instructive to the nations of the world who emphasize the power of territorial gods. The emphasis on the universality of God would also be instructive and encouraging to the Israelites as they returned home because they questioned God's ability to defend them while they were in exile. And they were told that the gods of the Babylonians were superior to the Hebrew God. Therefore, in a real sense, their return home was a theological affirmation of the power of Almighty God. Some concluding thoughts and reflections. Both in our personal lives 
and in society as a whole, there are times of chaos and uncertainty. Is there a reality bigger than the chaos we experience? Even in the midst of exile, Isaiah proclaims God reigns. The book of Isaiah is agreed to be one of the essential books in the Old Testament. The prophet Isaiah added to his people's knowledge of God and their awareness of the coming Messiah. He faithfully communicated God's message for his time and ours. The message Isaiah proclaimed condemning Judah's sin and proclaiming the need for social justice show how desperately reformation was needed in his day. Despite the dangers of Isaiah's day and the awareness that God would eventually punish Judah for her sins, Isaiah's final messages conveyed hope and confidence. That hope was wrapped up in the belief that God would bring his people back to the land and foster an intimate relationship with himself. Sin would be punished, but God would send a redeemer. That redeemer will rule over an eternal kingdom. Therefore, the people in Isaiah's day and our day had and have something and someone in which to hope. Our God reigns. To God be the glory. Are your feet beautiful? Don't just celebrate the good news of the gospel. Be a messenger. Let us pray. O oh God, who calls us to faith, empower us to leave the comfortable and familiar for places you would have the messenger of your son, the message of your son spread. And eternal God, you have an awesome track record regarding deliverance. Throughout history, you have always been active in delivering your people from bondage, whether physical, emotional, mental, relational, financial, communal, or spiritual. We thank you for the deliverance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.